Good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Dr. Anwar Bukharz, and I'm professor um, of counterterrorism and counter violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, I want to extend a very warm welcome to the many African Center uh, alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends who have joined us today for this webinar on lessons learned from CVE in Central Africa. Now I'd like to pass it over to, uh, to our Dean, Dr. Maliki, as to say a few words about uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Dr. Maliki. Uh, Dr. Bukars, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, and to everyone, uh, welcome to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies uh, is a US Department of Defense institution established and founded by Congress for the study of security issues uh, related to Africa, and also to serve as a forum for bilateral and multilateral research, communications, exchange of ideas, and training involving uh, military and civilian uh, participants. Our mission is to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Uh, we do our work along three main uh, areas. Academic programs uh, like this one. Uh, this one, of course, has the format of a webinar, uh, but we also offer uh, one, two, or three week uh, programs in a variety of topics uh, from countering uh, terrorism, countering violent extremism, uh, security sector governance, uh, rule of law. Um, cybersecurity, um, peace security operations, maritime security, uh, and a variety of other courses. In addition to that, uh, we have a very robust research and strategic communications uh, directorate. Uh, you are welcome to visit our website uh, and, and sample a variety of very powerful uh, research outputs uh, that we have. Also, uh, we have uh, a very extensive alumni network uh, throughout the continent. Uh, and we have a directorate uh, who's in charge of ensuring that uh, the outreach uh, and the partnerships uh, that we have on the continent uh, remain uh, robust uh, and continue to grow. Uh, this, in a nutshell, is the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, let me welcome you again, and, and I look forward to uh, hearing the presentations uh, and the contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marquez. Um, and now let's begin our session on lessons learned from CVE um, in, in Central Africa. We have two distinguished panelists, and that will provide an in-depth look at the origins, aims, drivers, and connections of the Congolese branch of the so-called Islamic State Central Africa province, uh, locally known as the Allied Democratic Forces, the ADF. And the analysis will consider dynamics in the group's composition, its modus operandi, its affiliations, as well as political and economic factors that have enabled <clears throat> these groups to uh, to persist. Uh, as you all know, I mean, the last three years have seen an escalation in the Allied Democratic Forces, the ADF, uh, terror campaign in Congo uh, and abroad. And despite the imposition of, um, of martial law in the ADF affected areas in May 2021 and the deployment of Ugandan troops inside uh, the DRC in late 2021, after a string of attacks within Uganda, the ADF has managed to consolidate and to expand its zone of operations. It has also broadened its recruitment base beyond 
the Eastern DRC and Uganda to Kenya, uh, Tanzania. It has also managed to generate new revenue streams I mean, by taxing timber production, gold mines, uh, and illegally exporting minerals such as Colton. So the trend lines are, um, are deeply troubling. But without an accurate understanding of the group's membership structure, its earnings, spending, strategies, priorities, and connections and affiliations, the efforts of states and regional authorities, as well as international actors uh, to counter uh, this threat are not likely to succeed. And this webinar will help facilitate this process of understanding the ADF by providing an in-depth analysis of the major characteristics you know, of this group and how you uh, deal uh, with this challenge. And to do that, uh, we are privileged today, again, to have uh, two distinguished uh, panelists with us. They have been on this program before, Mr. Dino uh, Mahtani and Dr. Uh, Annalie uh, Botha. Uh, Mr. Dino uh, Mahtani is an independent researcher and writer who works primarily on issues related to the growth of the so-called Islamic State in Africa. And he has just finished a short stint in the DRC, where he has developed new research for the Social Science Research Council, which has circulated to, uh, which has been circulated to a number of UN Security Council member states. And prior to this, he was the acting um, Africa director at the International Crisis Group, where he oversaw and edited the program's publications from across the continent as well as personally developing new research on the violent extremist rebellion in Mozambique and its regional uh, connections. And prior to joining Crisis Group, he served as a senior political advisor in the UN peacekeeping mission in DRC. Uh, Dean also started his career as a journalist for four years, working on the DRC and Nigeria. And then we have Dr. Anneli Botha. Uh, <laughs> Um, she's an independent consultant on radicalization, de-radicalization, reintegration, and terrorism in, in Africa. And she worked on several projects with different UN agencies, including UNODC, and previously in the UNDP Journey to Extremism in Africa, Drivers, Incentives, and the Tipping Point for Recruitment Project. In addition to research and policy advice, she has been at the forefront in developing and delivering capacity building initiatives to criminal justice actors on preventing, encountering violent extremism and terrorism uh, in especially Eastern Africa. Uh, and between 2017 and 2022, she was associated with the Department of Political Studies and Governance of the University of Free State in, uh, in, in uh, South Africa. So let's start with, um, with Mr. Dino Matani. Uh, so Dino, <clears throat> uh, there are some gaps in our understanding of how the Congolese branch of the Islamic State's Central Africa province, I mean, locally known as the Allied Democratic Forces, has organized uh, mm -hmm. uh, and what its primary motivation is. So given your, your expertise, given that you had been there, uh, done research there. Can you talk us through the ADF's origins, uh, aims, and drivers? Uh, Dino, please. <laughs> Thanks uh, very much. Um, I mean, in general terms, I, I should just sort of explain that this group has started as a uh, as an armed group that uh, was uh, actually two armed groups. Um, uh, fused together the Allied Democratic Forces and and what was known then as the National Army for the Liberation of Uganda, NALU, and was known as ADF NALU, formed in 1995 as a merger of two uh, Ugandan rebel movements uh, that uh, that ultimately fled both into into the DRC uh, uh, under Ugandan military pressure in the late 90s. Um, and the NALU faction uh, eventually disbanded. 
um, with the ADF leadership <clears throat> um, getting more active in the DRC after around 2013. And this is an armed group that essentially had gone from being uh, something with quite local aspirations within Uganda. Its leader, uh, Jamil Makulu, was sort of, an, a, a, in a way, well, an Islamist, although born a Christian, um, uh, had uh, been influenced by the Tablighi uh, sects in eastern Uganda, which was a sort of global Sunni Muslim revivalist movement, and um, uh, had also unleashed some terror campaigns in Kampala itself, uh, uh, few and far between, though, um, uh, uh, pushed into the DRC, uh, it's it, the scope of its of its of its operations and its and its uh, uh, agenda were sort of semi political in a way, um, although Islamist tinged. Uh, and over time, um, the ADF then intermarried into local communities in Eastern Congo, in the north part of North Kivu, known um, locally in the DRC as Le Grand Nord, the gr the Great uh, North and um, <clears throat> became intertwined with uh, intertribal politics uh, um, in, in that region throughout the Congolese wars and really sort of remained as a sort of uh, 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 a mercenary force that was used by um, the, the rebel movement, the Congolese rebel movement that controlled that area at the time, the RCDKML, led uh, during the war by Mbusa Nyamwisi, who incidentally today is a, is a minister in Shisekedi's government. Um, as this group sort of was used for local Congolese purposes, it developed its own um, local connections with uh, local chiefs, um, military officers, smugglers, business people, uh, and intermarried uh, across clan divides, in particular in one community, the Mbuba community, uh, which was um, subservient to the Nande, the Nande-led rebellion of, of the RCD KML. And uh, as we approached the elections in 20, uh, which actually finally took place in 2018, as those elections were delayed from about 2016 onwards, um, the, the violence became uh, even more pronounced. And, and so what started as civilian massacres in 2014 probably now we understand after years of research, instigated by elements of that former RCDKML rebellion who were then trying to oppose Kabila's um, prolongation of his presidential term. Those massacres started, but then were also co-opted. Part of the ADF was then also co-opted by the government uh, in order to push back against those RCDKML ex-rebels. And you had this very dirty war that, um, you know, where the ADF was sort of uh, split on both sides of a clan divide that were then being exploited by former rebels, RCD KML rebels, and the uh, Congolese military government, uh, oh, sorry, the Cong Congolese military under the government of Joseph Kabila. Uh, and of course, then there were other ethnic groups that were swept in on all sides. So it became the sort of coalition of armed actors on either side, with the ADF actually manipulating both sides of the conflict. And as the Congolese killed each other, they reinforced their position on the ground. Um, that being said, of course, um, the level of killing became sort of internationally repugnant, both for the UN and also members of the Security Council. Uh, there was a lot of pressure, military uh, operations to, 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 to strike against the ADF. And between uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, I have uh, military operations almost succeeded in 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 wiping out at least the eight, if not the armed group itself, but its resilience and its 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 appetite for further fighting. By the end of 2016, I remember being in the in the in the UN mission at the time. The ADF had almost sort of petered out in terms of its attack. This is around the time 2017 when new money started coming into the armed group. And this, uh, uh, now we understand, is the money that is possibly tied to, to Islamic State. Um, interviews I've had with ADF defectors and eyewitnesses, ADF former fighters who eyewitnessed the resurgence in 27, described at that time a number of East African fighters that started turning up in the camps of the ADF, notably Tanzanians, but also Kenyans, in addition to the Ugandan recruits that are the mainstay of the group's leadership and its high commanders. 
And then, you know, of course, it's got its component of Congolese fighters that have been abducted or swept into into the insurgency or into the into the armed into the armed group. But by 2017, we start seeing East African fighters coming in, and this is the portal through which it appears that Islamic State has now started channeling financial and other types of uh, uh, of support into, you know, uh, tactical advisory. Um, even even um, uh, helping them devise and 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 deploy improvised explosive devices now in in the in the current theater of war. Since 2017 onwards, we've seen that the leadership has also tilted very heavily in terms of its public affiliation with Islamic State. So Seka Baluku, the leader who took over from Jamil Makulu, who is who was himself arrested in Tanzania in 2015, and who disapproved by and large of of Islamic State affiliation, he felt that this was not in the group's interest. It was swaying the group outside its 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 original aims of having um, some kind of um, political war to fight against the Ugandan state, and being replaced by um, leaders who were being swept into the millenarian uh, jihadist objectives uh, 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 that we've seen uh, other jihadi groups um, adopt. Uh, throughout the Swahili coast and 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 Somalia and and and, and onwards, my research also in the last few years has pointed towards uh, a greater number of a great a greater a greater degree of connection, I should say, between the ADF and the Mozambican insurgency taking place in Cabo Delgado. These Tanzanians uh, were actually part of the former cohort that was Tanzanians and Kenyans, part of the former cohort of. East African jihadists who were once um, the foot soldiers of Al Shabab Somalia in the region, and Al Shabab Somalia, even though it runs itself and portrays itself as a its own um, um, you know its own entity, is affiliated to Al Qaeda traditionally. But these fighters that have been involved in terrorist attacks in Kenya, for example, or Uganda in 2010. Kenya, the Westgate shopping mall attack, the Dusit Hotel, and also um, some of the attacks against Garissa University in 2015 and, and, um, and the Kenyan coast in 2015, 2014. These, these fighters who've been chased from Kenya, who've um, uh, agglomerated with other associated Tanzanian radicals in Tanzania, were cracked down upon very heavily by the Tanzanian state in 2017. So this explains the watershed moment when many of them are pushed south into the Cabo Delgado conflict and also then west and north into the Great Lakes. And you see, you see that both the insurgency of the Mozambican insurgency starts in 2017 uh, around March, which is the, the first shots fired. And this is around the same time that the ADF started picking up its game in Eastern Congo. So all in all, what we've seen is the migration of an armed group that was deeply rooted in local uh, war economy, um, uh, political issues in the DRC itself after its expulsion from, from Uganda, and something which is now being slowly, uh, at least its leadership being tilted towards um, pursuing other objectives. And one of those objectives now appears to be the deployment of improvised explosive devices. And in the current context of turmoil in Eastern DRC, where you have uh, the rise of the M23 rebellion uh, and the geopolitical and regional tensions that have been uh, rising as a result of that, the biggest uh, beneficiary of that conflict is the ADF, because you have Congolese military units that were once deployed in the operational box for the ADF now being reassigned to fight the M23. And despite the Ugandan military's uh, uh, often quite um, effective raids against ADF bases in the Grand Nord now, the armed group is spreading into further and further into Ituri, but is also building um, uh, alliances with other armed groups in South Kivu. Uh, and spreading its its wings and and in in that sense and also relying much more heavily on mobile money transfers foreign money that appears to be coming in from outside uh the great lakes uh presumably channeled in by isis 
Um, there is some evidence to suggest that, certainly, via, um, for example, South Africa, uh, into East Africa, and then in, in many directions, the money is flowing to DRC, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique. Um, <clears throat> but the ADF's agenda is now uh, presumably being, being set by that, by that money. Um, uh, and as it, as it is being set, it's also deploying greater IEDs into play. And it's not just fighting conventional warfare uh, against the Congolese state. It's now targeting softer targets, uh, detonating bombs in churches, trying to whip up, even if the Congolese Muslim community is a very minority community in Eastern Congo, Christian Muslim rivalries are being whipped up and uh, soft targets are being chosen. Um, and there appears to uh, be more capability to strike um, uh, suicide bombs or to organize suicide bombs in major urban centers, including Beni, Goma, and possibly even Kinshasa. Excellent, uh, very exhaustive uh, tour d'horizon uh, uh, here. How we have seen how Ugandan movements in, in origin and how it put down the roots in Eastern Congo, uh, and how this group has become integrated into local communities, how it participates, you know, in cross border trade, how it manipulates disputes among local actors and communities. Uh, and how it has managed to establish also relations and uh, uh, with various armed groups and, and manipulates those. So the group fuels and feeds off, uh, you know, several uh, murky conflicts on 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 on, on the ground here. Uh, but also, you talked about the connections, obviously, mm -hmm. this uh, transformation of, of 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 the group into something much bigger. Um, let, let's go to the second question. Though you touched on. On, on, on this, I mean, the membership structure of the, of the group. You also touched on uh, another question I meant to ask you, the third one, you know, how meaningful are the group's foreign uh, connections and, and affiliations here? You talked about the group's regional recruitment and financial networks, uh, as well as the role that it is playing in the broader region. So so I wonder if, if you can expand a, a little bit on, on those, on the membership structure, uh, but also on these you know, recruitment and, and financial networks. And again, you, you touched on that uh, earlier, but if you can dig a little bit deeper, that, that would be, uh, I think, beneficial for, for our audience. Sure. So at the very top of the armed group is Musa Baluku, who, you know, has been part of the ADF, uh, you know, for, 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 for time immemorial, really, since, um, you know, the early days. But is now brought into the Islamic State's agenda as um, you know uh, uh, pre presents himself as a full-blown uh, disciple of, of of the Caliphate, um, and you know has taken the, is 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 understood to be taking Islamic State money in order to um, push that agenda. Now, with that money, the other commanders, the Ugandan commanders, who some of whom were acolytes of Jamil Mukulu, the, the first leader who I talked about earlier on, who's now in custody in, in Uganda and who had been somewhat uh, 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 against the idea of Baluku taking um, uh, the ADF uh, into the hands of IS. His former commanders, some of them don't seem to be uh, um, uh, that much in favor of Islamic State, but are following... Um, orders from Baluku because of the money and because if they step out of line, their security might be threatened, um, they could be betrayed, um, and Baluku keeps a, a very tight ship. That being said, some of his commanders are known to be approached now, for example, by certain actors potentially involved in dialogue to um, secure their surrender if they renounce the armed group, if they re renounce Islamic State. So there is a, there is a division even at the very top. But for the most part, they're following the rules that have been set by Baluku. Underneath them, then you have the Congolese uh, rank and file. These are young men who have been swept up from different villages, abducted or uh, without much prospects, joining the armed group um, with the promise of participation in war economies and booty and, and this sort of thing. Uh, then you have Ugandan recruits that are, are, have been... Um, you know, uh, pulled out of, of, of Uganda for uh, several years, decades even. Um, uh, uh, the ADF has a big recruitment network in Uganda, obviously. It's a, it's a Ugandan group by origin. And then um, 
other uh, uh, fighters who have come in, Tanzanians, uh, Kenyans, uh, Burundians now, small amount of Somalis. These are former, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, Al-Shabaab um, foot soldiers in the region, but now they've been repurposed by new money to support uh, Baluku, uh, Baluku's uh, agenda. Now, there's another dimension there. What we've some of the research I've I've been doing, we've seen, for example, on uh, uh, devices that were captured by the Mozambican insurgency. On those devices were um, uh, several recordings. Um, Islamic State propaganda, Nasheed's religious songs, but also the um, uh, sermons of uh, prominent um, uh, imams in um, uh, East Africa, uh, extremist and uh, um, uh, radical imams from Tanzania, from Burundi in particular, from those two countries in particular. And it appears that those two, um, th th those small group of, of, of imams may well be uh, involved in the uh, trafficking between Mozambique and Eastern Congo of fighters who have moved back and forth, potentially Tanzanians who fought in ADF have also moved uh, into um, Cabo Delgado to get battlefield experience there. Um, they've also, uh, the, these, these imams also appear to be uh, potentially involved in uh, the transfer of money they have influence, they have also wielded influence within the religious uh, Muslim community in the DRC itself. Um, there's the official uh, uh, Muslim community, um, you know, authorized by the government, known, known by its acronym as COMICO. And what I understand is some of the COMICO um, representatives from different parts of, of, of the country are being swayed by new money. Again, it's, it's again money coming in from um, and being channeled in by these radical imams uh, to give them loyalty, to also operate as um, uh, sort of reserve cells in a way. Um, what's a good way of putting it? The, the, these people would organize safe houses for um, um, fighters coming from Mozambique, for example, who would cross Tanzania, go through Burundi, go into South Kivu and then be trafficked up to North Kivu where they would receive training. But on their journey there, they would need safe housing in, in, in major cities like Goma, uh, also in South Kivu in Uvira, uh, which is facing Lake Tanganyika. We understand that um, the ADF have some safe houses there that are probably being managed by some, some um, religious figures. So uh, that, that in a way explains you know some of the 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 membership and leadership and and interconnections. What I noticed also in the trip I've just completed in in the DRC is that there are there is another armed group, for example, um, way west in South Kivu, into Maniema province. Actually, Maniema is actually the birthplace of Islam in the DRC. It's where the slave raiders came uh, during the time of Tipu Tip. Uh, uh, to take slaves and also build mosques. Um, and unlike um, uh, the demography of Eastern Congo, which is only um, in its most concentrated form up to about 15 to 20% Muslim population on the sea, on the, on the lake from about um, Uvira in South Kivu down to Kalemi uh, across Lake Tanganyika. The population of Kasongo district in Maniema is, is, is in some places up to 90%. Um, so this is a bastion of, 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 of Congo's Islamic community. It appears also to be um, the, the territory where the armed group Mai Mai Malaika has many of its um, uh, connections. And Malaika, the Mai Mai Malaika was uh, videotaped earlier this year or at the end of last year, beating women for wearing short skirts near Kasongo territory and behaving in this very sort of um, uh, radical manner, um, enforcing dress codes um, and local Sharia laws, uh, very much like how the Mozambican insurgents started several years before they moved into their armed phase. And what we understand is my mind, Malaika has built a connection to the ADF. Now, they had sent some fighters up to North Kivu, we understand, to be 
trained. Um, I understood that they were intercepted and, and some of them are jailed. Um, so it's not clear to what extent Malaika is depending on the ADF, but clearly it is part of an overall ecosystem that is now developing uh, that spreads much beyond North Kivu, and that is also connected to, according to local Congolese intelligence uh, officers who operate in uh, remote uh, locations in South Kivu, they, st they have started um, uh, picking up on the influx, continued influx of Tanzanians, uh, Burundians, uh, Kenyans, even Mozambicans uh, who've come through South Kivu, who probably may even have some connection to Mai Mai Malaika, uh, who are around the gold mines of, of Salamabila. Uh, and if the Mozambicans have anything to do with Mai Mai Malaika, they will be telling uh, that armed group, well, look what happened to us. We were thrown out of the ruby mines in Montepuez. Uh, these, this is the actions of, of uh, you know, the, uh, a, a greedy monopolistic state. Um, and we know that my my Malaika has ambitions for natural resources. So there's a lot of intersection between these armed groups that are uh, proliferating in a broader broader ecosystem of regional jihad that stretches into East Africa, involving radical imams uh, uh, who are um, also connected to um, you know the financial uh, architecture and the recruitment architecture of the ADF and Islamic State. <clears throat> Excellent, Dino. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the ADF represents uh, I mean, truly a confluence of unique attributes and, and common characteristics here. It's defined by uh, how you describe it as particular environments, obviously, but it's also shaped I mean, by all these regional elements that you describe, by its regional, transnational uh, aspirations, or by the intersection of all these uh, uh, regional uh, armed, uh, armed, armed groups. Uh, um, I don't know what the degree of, uh, you talked a lot about, uh, uh, you know, ISIS, uh, but ISIS core, I don't know what the, the degree that, that ISIS core, obviously, uh, degree of influence that uh, ISIS has over IDF, uh, does it have, uh, does it exert, I mean, any con command and control over them? Uh, but we can come to this, to this question, I think, uh, I think later. Now, let, let's turn to, uh, to Anneli. Um, uh, Anneli, how have governments, I mean, sought to, to deal with this, I mean, with all these, uh, uh, you know, terror attacks, uh, and obviously with their with their root causes. Uh, thanks, Anwar, and thanks for the wonderful opportunity to speak at this meeting. Uh, it's always fascinating to hear from other experts like Dino, and, and thanks, Dino, for that fascinating overview of the ADF. Um, so first and foremost, asking or answering your question, um, I think one need to make a distinction between the situation in the DRC itself that is confronted with not only the ADF, but also numerous other organizations that Dino mentioned uh, before. So the situation in, in the DRC, especially in Eastern DRC, uh, that is unfortunately uh, historically ungoverned, um, that experience challenges regarding access or control over uh, from from Kinshasa sites over to the eastern part of the DRC, and on the other that's the one side, and the other side in terms of how to deal with violent extremism and terrorism and preventing um, radicalization and recruitment, is also a situation in Uganda and Rwanda that we've hinted on, but also beyond that, I think that we have to understand this is a not a DRC problem. This is really a regional problem. So the question is how countries dealt with it. So in terms of the situation in the DRC itself, we know that the most, uh, the, 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 the primary focus is to use uh, more military pressure. Um, the, the question of you've um, Dino hinted on it, uh, the involvement of Ugandan forces in moving into the DRC in Eastern DRC following the attacks in Uganda, uh, the first in, in, in many years um, that, that occurred um, in, in, in Uganda. And that also, for me, leads to the question of, in terms of understanding how governments deal with terrorism, 
is that that first and foremost the con or not conflict but the differences between a military approach versus a crime and justice approach um, in addressing it and how one could merge the two. So in terms of uh, the ADF, and I'm going to refer to ADF because I think that um, they would the ADF would want us to see them as an Islamic state offshoot um, as they as they present itself to be. Um, but I would speak a bit later on in terms of that marriage of convenience, um, and and I would rather say let's let's focus on the, on the ADF um, per se, although it it they try to present itself as something bigger and larger. So the immediate was basically to for Ugandan um, and DRC military commanders that managed to to claim to kill quite a few. Uh, ADF combatants and destroy also the, the group Safe Haven um, since 2021. Um, the concern that I noticed is that with this um, clampdown, military clampdown on the ADF, one see that the lethality of ADF operations also increased. Um, Dino mentioned, uh, started to focus the attention on uh, targeting churches. Um, that is concerned because the question is they want to portray themselves as as fighting a, a fight between between Muslim and Christian that is not supposed to be. Uh, we also know that Monusco have been involved in in the eastern part of the DRC as well as so many other UN agencies in trying to deal with situation. And uh, not only again with regards to the ADF, but also other organisations itself as well. So that is a, for the military approach. Um, then. I think one also have to mention just briefly the Nairobi process in order to bring all of these other organizations that have external link to it um, to solve that issue in addition to the Luanda process that is that is addressing uh, the internal issues as well. So um, that is, I think we, we need to, it's, it's so many things happening at the same time as well. Um, what I would like to just mention very, very briefly is the importance of, of having an exit strategy. Um, and I think that in that sense, one could learn a few lessons from the situation in the way Uganda dealt with, with the ADF as well as the LRA. It's, I think it's a lot of lessons one could learn from that. Um, in terms of dealing with these organizations, um, the question of amnesty has been mentioned before and uh, Uganda uh, offered through its Amnesty Act in 2000 uh, led to the disengagement of quite a few um, of both the LRA as well as the ADF. Um, according to, to the Amnesty Commission um, in 2021, December 2021, over 20,621 rebels basically made use of this process. So I think one need to think of in terms of how to address with this with this challenge, uh, keep that in mind. Interestingly enough, in the early in the early stages, um, blanket amnesty was provided to rebels that denounced violence and that went through a typical DDRR process um, that one would 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 go through in terms of normal conflict. With the new phase of a national transitional uh, justice policy that was introduced in 2019, uh, one noticed that there, there's no longer a blanket amnesty being provided, but that its focus is also to, to, um, to have a judicial process in which there is a arrest and prosecution um, for the most uh, leadership role players within the organization. I think that is also in terms of how to address this challenge in the future. It will come down to the question of how do you deal with uh, the commanders and how do you deal with the lower ranked uh, individuals that may have joined for different reasons and may not be as guilty with um, with abuses, with human rights abuses, with um, terrorism, with crimes against humanity, war crimes, and so forth, because it basically links to that particular issue as well. Um, and the same also can be said regarding the situation in Rwanda as well. Rwanda also went through the same process 
of uh, Rwanda Demobilization and Reintegration Commission that was created in 1997 and the way they dealt with it. My concern in terms of especially dealing with the ADF in the future is, is the fact that having a military approach, and we noticed that in the case of, of the operations since 2021, basically leads to a spread. Um, you basically, it's a balloon effect. You, you, put, you place pressure on one side and you see the spread towards areas that's not being affected before. That's the first thing. The second thing is that N23 immediately claimed that it's acting on behalf of communities uh, and protecting vulnerable communities that you also don't want to, to see uh, emerging. So that for me is, is the one side. So the, the hard side of things is, I think, is, is one way of, of dealing with it. The preventing violent extreme bodies, I think there's an area that we haven't spoken, haven't had a lot of discussion on in the, in the past. And I think one need to focus on that. So, um, and I link that to a more criminal justice framework approach. So in terms of to arrest, um, to build a criminal case, to prosecute those involved. I don't, I don't think, and I, I think we need to be honest with one another, that a military approach shooting ourselves through this process is not going to be effective. They need to be a, fr a, a framework in terms of enhancing a criminal justice approach. And I think Uganda has played has, has enormous strides being made in the, in, in the past um, in dealing with this. Uh, we've heard the question of arrest being made uh, with uh, Jamil in, in Tanzania, uh, the question of extradition, sending a person back to face charges within Uganda itself. That is the first that is, I think, is an enormous success. In addition to other cases, uh, the 2010 attacks um, I just come to mind, and also the, the prosecution of, of individuals arrested in Tanzania, again, being transferred to uh, Uganda to face trial is another area. So I would say in terms of addressing how do you deal with this, we can basically categorize it in different in different boxes. The first is a military approach, dealing with bringing the situation under control. The second for me is coming down to the question of how do we deal with a criminal justice framework in addressing those involved in these cases and bringing them to justice. And then lastly, the question of how do we deal with, uh, with preventing violent extremism that is what I would refer to as a whole of government, to government approach that we need to focus on. And I don't think we haven't dealt with that. Um, and secondly, a whole of society approach, because you also have to think about how do we prevent people from joining these organizations in the first place? Um, so in terms of addressing it, I think the, the focus has been in the case of the ADF, predominantly more military um, as it is now. Um, and we need to focus more in terms of situation, not only in the DRC, but also situation in Uganda, as well as in Rwanda, where it's arrest being made, but also beyond that. Um, and, and I think that will also be something to discuss um, in, um, in the open discussion a bit later on. So over to you. Oh, sure. Thank you, uh, uh, Anneli. Again, same, same, same problem, predominantly uh, short-term security perspective. So, you know, governments like we've seen elsewhere, they try to, uh, you know, eliminate the, the problem of, uh, of violent extremists or suspected extremists I mean, through several means, sometimes disappearances, uh, extrajudicial killings, but this can create a balloon effect, obviously. Um, but governments, they... They, uh, as, as yourself noted and you wrote about it, uh, they seldom look into the, um, you know, their own role, obviously, in, in what causes this in, in the first place, which is the communal marginalization frustration here. So we have to look at the root, the root cause um, uh, of this. Let's go to the second question. And again, you, you know, like you, know, you, st you started addressing this, right? You laid out, well, here is how governments have responded um, to the threats, but we know that governments have struggled to deal with the, with the ADF. That's why the threat is metastasizing, it's becoming bigger <clears throat> than, than it was. So why, why, why the struggle to deal with the ADF? I mean, you laid out, you know, what should be done, but obviously governments have not, done that for for the most part you mentioned uganda 
uh, you know, some positives in there, but, but nonetheless, uh, the approach seems not to, uh, to be working. So, uh, so why the, the struggle? Yeah, I think um, that as long as we have ungoverned spaces, as long as we have a situation in the case of Eastern DRC, um, Dino mentioned the situation in, in Cabo Delgado and the area there. As long as there's areas that that can be used, um, because I think that we need to understand terrorism from from the way it manifests itself. Uh, so the countries being targeted, but also the areas where you have recruitment organization to send individuals to these areas where they can actually gain more uh, experience, um, where they can actually go about. Um, in terms of training, uh, gathering um, experience, and so forth. So for as long as the, the situation is in the Eastern DRC is going to continue, where you're going to have this, this situation of limited control, and this is not only li limited to the DRC. I think, I think uh, control, government control, can also be seen as, we often think of safe havens as, as areas where there's no government control, but can also go, safe havens can also be within countries where there is government control, but no access uh, of security forces in, in, in intelligence gathering, in terms of um, dealing with, with individuals that's marginalized and so forth. So uh, for me, the complexity of the ADF basically comes down to the question of lack of governance, lack of government control, um, and where you have sometimes um, government control, um, to what extent would government reflect the best interest of all, all its people? So the question of, of marginalization um, is for me is also an, an area of, of concern for as long as we're going to have that. So as long as we have marginalization within communities, we can have continue to have a problem. Um, and this basically leads to this to this question of, but how do you address this? And um, I don't want to jump the, the gun, but I think we also have to start to understand what is actually driving radicalization, recruitment, and understanding the complexity of, it's not one thing. It is not religion. It is not poverty. It is not... Um, social exclusion. They are so, it, it's such a multi complex issue that for as long as we're not going to see it for the complexity it is and address those complexities, um, we are not going to find a solution to it. And we're going to see this re emergence because, again, if you look at the ADF and its, and its development, it had these cycles, these cycles of, 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 of growth and decline. And then again, the question was the new cycle, the, the uh, changing the name and uh, adopting a new ideology provide a new lifeline to the organization. So overall speaking, um, it is, we need to ac accept the complexity of it. And we need to start to accept that in terms of addressing it will require not focusing on organization, but focusing on individuals. What makes what makes this? Why are people joining? For what reason are people joining? And addressing those reasons, um, and bringing in not only a military approach, but also, as I mentioned earlier, a whole of government, a whole of society approach, in addressing these issues. Absolutely. Um, Again, it's, it's a holistic approach to a very complex uh, uh, problem here, right? I mean, how do you work on that social contract, really, between the state, the public, between the state, security forces, and the public here? Uh, and this is what you mentioned, you know, in, in your first response as well. I think that's why it needs to be more focused on security sector reform, these community policing initiatives. But that requires trust, it requires dedication, and and, and time, so it's not enough just to invest in uh, uh, in 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 the military, but but also you have to focus, as you said, you know, in the police and the broader criminal justice framework, including the judiciary, the prisons, and then you have to address the root causes here. 
because uh, Adrian Sandrou causes is as you, as as you wrote, uh, I can't remember uh, where exactly, but uh, is not the responsibility of the security agencies only. So you need this whole of government approach, whole of society approach that starts with good governance, with providing basic public goods. Uh, 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 equally. Uh, so finally, based on, on your research, uh, uh, and again, it links to, 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 uh, to question two and question one, what is the most important finding I mean, to inform the current responses to ADF? Yeah. Sure, that only one. Um, it's, if, 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 if you're gonna allow me to, to, to um, throw more than one into it, I think, of course, <laughs> it first and foremost, it first and foremost comes down to understanding national vulnerabilities and breaking it down, not only in terms of I'm not only referring to the DRC again, as I said, I think this is a far more complex issue. Dina mentioned the question of of um, money being sent from the from South Africa. We know that South Africa and the link to to Mozambique and um, and so this is for me is a much broader discussion. So if we want to address this, I think we need to very be carefully understand what makes not only countries vulnerable, but what makes um, communities vulnerable, individual communities. So it starts with understanding the vulnerabilities and addressing those vulnerabilities. Linked to this is understanding why individuals join, not why the organization exists, but why individuals would want to associate themselves with organizations that kill and maim um, innocent people um, and address those issues. I'm extremely concerned by the ability of the ADF to, if you look at the videos and the ability to um, reach out to young children within the training camps. Um, and also, the, and we see the same thing also occurring in the DRC, in not only in the DRC, but also in, in Cabo Delgado as well. Um, the ability of them to, and it, it, make, it makes you think about the child, child soldiers way back. Um, and for me, that is, a, again, a, a real concern. So how do we uh, deal with and harden our communities against the possibility of being um, be infiltrated by individuals with ulterior motives and address those issues. So it comes back to the question of one need to understand the individual factor to it. So I know it's a mouthful. And so in terms of, of, of my research, it would come down to understanding the individual reasons why, being proactive, um, start, uh, start um, protecting our children and also including um, working with families, working with, with teachers, with how do you address those issues itself as well within the broader community. Um, and linked to that all comes back to the question of intelligence. I think we're not the main, the main focus in terms of addressing these issues for me comes back to the question of intelligence, how to be proactive, not waiting till you have a problem, but be proactive in terms of preventing attacks. And we saw that in the case of Uganda, but also at the same time, also deal with the situation of how to, to, to identify individuals at risk and not go out and arrest and, 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 and um, arrest the family and, and, and be hard, but have a softer approach in, in addressing these issues. So with that, over to you, Anwar. Absolutely, excellent. Again, the importance of diagnosing the, the problem, uh, understanding national vulnerabilities, uh, look at the, you know, the macro level is very important, but you have also to look at the micro uh, level, why individuals join, I mean, why do they associate with the organizations, as you said, that kill and, and, and maim. Uh, uh, ADF reach out to young uh, uh, children. So, so you know how how do you do that, and how do you obviously uh, prevent prevent that? Um, so, with that, thank you to the our two panelists uh, for their excellent insights uh, from your work on on this critical topic, um, and thank you all for following our conversation. 
uh, I hope you found it uh, useful. So now we will move to the uh, Q&A session. <clears throat> so the growth of violent extremism on the African continent is evident, obviously, uh, but it's also evident in Southern Africa, uh, specifically in the DRC and Mozambique. So the question is, you know, that Dino addressed and, and, and Ali touched on as well is, what's the possibility of further expansion here uh, into other theaters? of the southern sub-regions, such as South Africa itself, such as Angola, uh, Zambia, uh, and other countries of, of, this, of this zone. Um, a similar question here, that there is a heavy flow of trafficked person from the Horn down towards South Africa. So is this trafficking, uh, the question goes, not integrated with mobility of these fighters from one theater to another. Uh, and then the third question is, uh, and this one to be, you know, uh, you talked about the imams. <laughs> Sorry, so where do the imams uh, receive their funds? But I guess we'll start with these three and, <clears throat> and open it up. I'll start with Dino. Yeah, um, well, those are all pretty um, inter interrelated questions. Let's let's um, answer the the spread of this. Is is down the coast of is down the coast of the uh, the Swahili coast from Somalia down to Mozambique, and it's also then from East Africa um, across uh, in a westerly direction into the DRC. Um, but let me just describe you. Sort of the the major trends. I I I um I would say the first thing is is if you keep the idea of trouble coming down the Swahili coast to Mozambique, um, uh, the Mozambican insurgency was inspired. You know the insurgents there were inspired by um, uh, radical Kenyan, for example, uh, preachers like Abu Drogo who were popular in Mombasa in the early two thousand and tens. Um, Akaburi as well. These were two preachers who were killed um, in very murky circumstances um, in Mombasa. And um, to many uh, radicals on in East Africa became um, symbolic martyrs against uh, oppressive states uh, or, or the oppressive Kenyan state against um, uh, uh, marginalized Muslim communities. Um, and you know the, the Mozambican insurgents were were reading and consuming pamphlets and videos of 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 of, of Rogo and and Makaburi. So that's sort of one direction of of uh, of of play. And then, of course, within that, you have criminal networks um, uh, uh, involved in, in 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 human trafficking, also on the coast of. Um, Tanzania and 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 Kenya and also Mozambique and these are very complex environments in which um, uh, I'll give you an example that the the traffickers of Mozambique were often you know the, those who played the role of for example bringing in heroin from ocean going dows onto the beaches were fishermen uh, who got paid very little and who became insurgents later on. But then uh, before they were being insurgents, they were also at some point doing this kinds of drug smuggling for um, and people smuggling for um, more powerful interests in Mozambique who were more, probably more connected to the, um, the elites of Cabo Delgado. So there's a sort of criminal system uh, of, of, of smuggling that's also permissive to um, and which which throws up this this sort of resentment by those who are not paid enough at the bottom of that system against those uh, who who they see as as profiting from that system and tied to the elites. And then, you know, in many ways, the, the Mozambican rebellion was was a rebellion of the shop floor of that system, um, of, of the of the working class of that system against against the elite uh, traffickers who were paying them. So, you know, you have religious sort of indoctrination coming down the Swahili coast all the way from Somalia via via via, via East Africa and then and then Mozambique 
and um, and then you know the Tanzanian and Kenyan and East African fighters or, and Ugandans going west into into the DRC. But this is also you know there's also a, a, a hub very much based in 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 South Africa of um, criminal gangsters who are part of the um, uh, kidnap and extortion um, rings in South Africa and who have jihadist orientations who somehow seem to be um, um, able to conduct their affairs uh, with with minimal sort of challenges against them. Um, I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot to be said about how the state in South Africa has not um, been as successful as it might have been in prosecuting some of these individuals. Um, and as the, as the insurgency is also spreading in in, in in East Africa, so, or sorry, in Cabo Delgado, it's moved um, west into Nyasa province of 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 um, of northern Mozambique, which then borders on Malawi. And we understand around late Malawi, there's some Christian and Muslim tensions building up. We also understand that in the past, the Malawian authorities have arrested people who've been trafficked by, um, you know, on behalf of the ADF, going to South Africa for some for some purpose. In South Africa itself, so this is really a uh, an ecosystem that's tied together from Somalia all the way down to South Africa via uh, criminal networks, via um, uh, uh, associated uh, networks of, of of regional jihadis as well. And um, when it comes to the imams, um, you, you know, where where are they getting their money from? And you know, cer certainly it's it's of interest that um, the moderate imams in eastern Congo are paying a very heavy price. They're being assassinated and their assassinations are being tied to um, uh, to the ADF. So there's a policy um, which looks like it's being pushed by Islamic State to hire assassins and kill off the moderate imams, create an environment that is more polarized and push forward more radical voices in the DRC ecosystem. And as I described before, some of some of the imams in 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 East Africa seem to be the ones who are sort of pushing that agenda. Where are they getting their money from? Well, you know, there's a lot that seems to be coming via mobile money. Um, I mean, they they're probably getting money from from overseas donations, um, religious donations, but also. Um, there's a the, the, there is some public work that's been published on this of of um, uh, money that has come out of the criminal system in South Africa that is is also pouring into um, in, in, into the hands of some of these actors in East Africa. I don't know, Annalie, whether you want to add anything uh, 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 here? Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, South Africa has been mentioned quite a lot, and yeah. I think that one one definitely need to maybe just mention a few things regarding that. Um, I think the first thing that that Southern Africa, not South Africa, Southern Africa, Africa overall, have seen itself almost isolated from violent extremism um, as it happened or occurred to 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 spread over the last 20, 20 plus years. Um, and I think that the situation in in Cabo Delgado, basically proved to be a bit of a wake-up call. Uh, although, if you look at internally within South Africa, and I've done a lot of work um, in terms of violent extremism um, in South Africa while I was still uh, before I um, joined the ISS, was that nothing happens overnight. Uh, and I don't think we should make the mistake to see this sudden emergence of violent extremism and South Africa being used as a potential safe haven for violent extremists as suddenly it's new. It's not, it's, it, it has a very long history to it. Um, so that is that for me is the first point to make. Um, also one cannot limit um, the spread of ideology. Um, and, and yes, that is why I'm saying what I said earlier is to I need to make a, a, a analysis of what makes a country vulnerable and what, what makes individual communities vulnerable. Uh, to be used. Um, just to give an example, I mean, um, Thomas, uh, Thomas Mohammed that was involved in the 98 bombings in, in Dar es Salaam was arrested in South Africa in 1999. 
Um, so it, it, and the question you immediately ask is, but why South Africa? Um, the 7-7 plots, the 721 plots, um, you had South African links uh, to it. So one, one definitely need to understand that this is a, a much broader uh, challenge to deal with uh, overall. And I think we tend to think about terrorism when attacks happen and they need to raise concern. Um, but when all of these, uh, basically, whether it's training, whether it, it is uh, the spread of ideology, whether it's a question of financing happens, it all happens underneath the surface and nobody notices it until uh, it, it becomes too late. And that's often also a concern within governments itself as well, is that keep in mind, and I mentioned intelligence is so, so critically important, but if there's no threat, the question is, would one look at, because it, it requires a lot of resources, it requires a lot of, of money, time, energy, uh, you have to develop the capabilities within the country to actually look for, for issues. And I don't think that in Southern, Southern Africa overall, not only South Africa, Southern Africa overall, have always looked internally in terms of how its countries are being used by violent extremist elements. Um, and one could, one could see it in, in the sense of, of, yes, there's been an increase in the number of attacks, there's increase in recalization rec recruitment people from South Africans um, that is that is involved in the fight um, in Cabo Delgado and so forth. Um, and I would trace it back to the early Pagat years in, in the 1990s, beginning 2000s, uh, in understanding the, the root of violent extremism. So in overall, we will make a mistake to see this re-emergence or emergence as something new. It is simply not new. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Anwar. Absolutely. Uh, okay, well, we have more uh, <laughs> questions coming in. One is on the, I mean, the, the relationship of the ADF with local communities. I mean, because how you described it, you know, is it seems the core of the ADF is seems detached from local communities, you know, all these regional transnational fighters here in a way that that's quite different from how other extremist insurgencies operate if you look at the Sahel and elsewhere so what what is that that relationship here um another one is to go back to the core here uh, what Emily talked about discuss the causes of, we have to understand and study the causes for the population to choose to join these fighters and how to address them uh, so do we know uh, what, what these causes are? I mean, uh, studies been made on this particular uh, 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 topic here. Uh, there was also a question on the recruitment side. And again, Anna, you talked about this, you know, recruiting youth and, and others. So, so one of the questions was, well, then how, how, do, you, how do you address that? Uh, so military force may not bear much fruits and it can be counterproductive. So, but how do we deal with, with this issue? Um, so how do we make a dent on uh, the ADF's uh, ability I mean, to recruit uh, young people? Uh, there was, I think, a question there on the ability to recruit even women in, in this regard. Um, so yeah, let's let's open it up and, and then we'll have, a, after that, a final final round of, of question, because there is one on that whole of government approach that uh, that uh, they want you to expand on, but leave that to the to the to the last round. So I'll start with Anna. Well, uh, in terms of recruitment, um, we in terms of areas where, for example, where IDF is act active, as well as in situation in 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 Mozambique, you find that you have one issue is the question of force recruitment, where areas have been taken over by, by insurgents or, or violent extremists. And by not joining is, is basically a death sentence. So it, it, it comes down to people join out of, listen, survival. Um, that's the first, the, the first point. Um, recruitment overall in terms of um, beyond conflict areas, 
um, I, again, I touched on it. It's, there's some multiple reasons for why people join. Um, I, I would first and foremost say the question of marginalization, frustration, um, and the way often governments respond to terrorism is, is often one of the main driving factors. And I think it's a lot of, we, we tend to miss this, um, that adventure also comes to play in some cases, where um, I, in terms of interviews being conducted by um, before, not only in terms of ADF, but others, where um, this, this, this romanticization almost being seen as fighting for something bigger than yourself, um, and 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 um, you cannot join the military, cannot join sometimes the police. So it's a sense of looking for something bigger and greater than myself. I don't think a lot of, I, and I think we tend to make the mistake. We see the ADF where it comes down to religious connotations. I think a very small minority really join for a religious ideology. Um, I think that the majority of them. Um, is for a multiple of, of other reasons why did they become involved. Even within organization, organizations itself, um, if you look, for example, ADF and you do interviews with them, a very small minority have an ideological commitment to the cause. Um, the, the, the vast majority uh, join for very different reasons. So we, we also have to make the distinction between not seeing it as we are now basically dealing with a religious organization and 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 religious dialogue would be the the first way of addressing this um it it it, it it's, it's far more complex um than that in assessing and and addressing it beyond the area um and the the, the sense of belonging the sense of 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 i've i i'm i'm part of something uh, broader it is, I think, is areas where, where we need to, to focus our attention on. Um, previous work, I've, I focused quite a bit in terms of the individual motivations uh, before, and I'm not going to go into it, but, I, but, but overall speaking, um, one, I think there's a far more studies that need to be done um, in, in the future, and I maybe would like to encourage a lot of the audience to start to do a bit more studies in terms of understanding why individuals become involved in violent extremist organizations and address those issues. Um, and uh, but with that, I'm going to hand over to you because I think it's a this is part of a much broader discussion um, overall. So over to you, Anwar. Of course, thank you, uh, Dino. Do you want to weigh in on this? Or? The question on on the local communities. I mean. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the ADF is quite is 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 a very different beast than the Mozambican insurgency. The Mozambican insurgency is a socio-political uh, insurgency. If you ask me, it comes out of um, societal issues and divisions, marginalization of certain communities um, uh, who who are now you know feeding into you know the most. Um, the biggest sort of uh, suppliers of, of fighters to the insurgency are from two communities in particular in, in Cabo Delgado. Um, and whereas the ADF didn't have that social political roots. I mean, it may have done in Uganda um, in, its, in its very early days, as, I, as I'd mentioned, but by the time it had moved into the DRC, it just became a mercenary killing machine that was activated in 2014 for the reasons that I explained. And it still continues to do that. It has to uh, uh, conduct its affairs through the war economy, through the, the, the armed group systems that exist in the DRC. Uh, it kills civilians, now sometimes branding um, them as Christians or, or, I, or Islamic State stepping in to take credit on its propaganda channels um, by saying that the ADF is killing Christians, but it is for the most part killing uh, individuals for very local reasons um, um, that have to do with, with the state of conflict in the, in the DRC itself. Um, uh, so in that sense, on a day-to-day -day basis, the ADF, well, it's now been pushed out of 
its former bastions in the Grand Nord and more occupying territory in, in Ituri and in other areas of, of the Grand Nord where they've been sort of pushed even further west of, of Beni by the Ugandan military forces um, uh, in cooperation with some elements of the Congolese army. Um, but they, they're still very much integrated into, into, into local affairs. That said, the transnational leaders, so for example, um, Akwabasi, or who is known as Jundi, a Tanzanian, uh, um, if you look at him, he, 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 you may mistake him as coming from Yemen, or, or, or as he has been mistaken in the past, or, or from Somalia. Um, but he's, he's one of the principal IED makers. He's one of the, he was the one who brought the black flag of the Islamic State into the ADF. Um, also, actually, from had originally, even though he's Tanzanian national, had been based in Durban, South Africa. Um, and these guys, him and some of the other transnationals, occupy another camp where they're busy, you know, um, uh, uh, fabricating IEDs, giving trainings in IED uh, manufacturing, receiving instructions from the ISIS um, uh, faction in Puntland in northern Somalia. This is. This is the this is the main faction that um, hands down um, apparently hands down sort of orders or advice to uh, other ISIS factions like the ADF or the Mozambican insurgency. So um, it's a, it's still it's it's still very much rooted in Congolese local dynamics. That's the reality of, of conflict and warfare, uh, and they live in that reality. But uh, in a separate camp. There's an, that you know they, they there are individuals who now are able to uh, take advantage, as Anneli said, of ungoverned space and sit there far from any possibility of being interdicted to plot uh, uh, regional terrorist threats, such as they did uh, for the one that um, was executed in Kampala in late 2021. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and now to the last round, we have. Um approximately 10, 10 minutes. Uh, so one is, is, is general and one is, 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 is specific. Um, the one specific is about the geopolitical aspect of it. So um, is there a possibility, the question goes, to fight this war without geopolitical solutions? Uh, meaning without due consideration to the economic interests related to the availability of minerals in, in, in the region here. Um, so, and, and similarly, uh, another question is, can it be said that violent extremism is spreading because of rivalry between regional powers here for strategic resources in, in Central in Central Africa? And a third question that relates to, to this. So, uh, and the, the general one is, you know, for uh, some time now, uh, the question goes, researchers are pointing to the complexity of the fight against violent extremism and terrorism. Um, uh, you know, Anneli, you mentioned whole of government, all of society approaches. Uh, uh, so what more effective and rapid uh, solutions can, can you suggest, uh, Anneli, and, and obviously Dino as, as well, because the the person who asked the question, they said, well, states continue to be blamed for not being effective enough. Well, then what, what can we do uh, now, obviously, right? At the short term, obviously midterm and, and, and the long term, but at the short term. Um, yeah, and then a question, sorry, about the organized crime. It was obviously made the bulk of, of what we talked about here, uh, the role of criminality. So what can be done to combat organized crime? And this was particularly what can the African Union do? Or what can, I can even add, you know, SADC and, and other organizations, the RECs do to, to tackle this issue. Uh, so if I can, you know, start with, uh, with Dino and then uh, end with uh, Annalie and, and this would be it. Um, so Dino, uh, any, if you want to address the geopolitical or, or, or the general question or both, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 speak to the geopolitical one. Um, Excellent. I I I advised the Security Council about a year uh, ago, where I warned that 
um, the growth of, of this uh, violent extremist network that we've been talking about today that spans you know, from Somalia to South Africa, really via the DRC, East Africa, and Mozambique, uh, is coming at a time uh, when the interests of regional powers, at least in the, in the Great Lakes, at least the regional powers that project their ambitions into the Great Lakes are colliding with each other. And there's no question, as I mentioned before, that the ADF is a, is a major beneficiary of the M23 rebellion that really is a political structural problem that has um, come back again. Uh, it was, you know, as we know, it was a rebellion. I mean, it first emerged as a rebellion in 2012, but then prior to that, um, what, what, what was, you know, what, um, you know, had 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 been preceded by various iterations of the same problem, uh, the CNDP, and then you know the Rwandan-backed RCD Goma rebellion of the of the Congolese wars and so forth. So. Uh, this is a structural problem that, that 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 is now opening the space for, in my view, a more menacing problem that is now coming up the road. And without some form of of, of regional de-escalation of uh, of regional governments putting their heads together, not just the Sadak region but also the East African region, and both those regions are, are appear to be in tension with each other. If you look at what's happening now in the DRC. The Sadak region is 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 more or less criticizing the East African community's military um, uh, uh, plan, which hasn't dealt with the M23, in which um, it now looks as if it's going to be uh, pushed aside to 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 foreground potentially a Sadak force, or at least this is what the Sadak region is is pushing for. Um, none of that is going to help matters if. Um, you know, the, the Congo's neighbors are are all scrabbling for a piece of 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 of, of the pie, or to be the primary military actors uh, uh, in the region to push their geopolitical agendas. Um, what the what the region really actually needs to do is 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 sit together, first resolve these political problems, and I, I think that's actually the hard the harder thing to do because these th these problems have not been resolved for. For, for, for decades already. But what they can do is, is, for example, work, you know, in a very precise way. And one of the recommendations I've come up with in, in, in more recent writings is to really emphasize what can be done on financial investigations. Because as I've mentioned um, throughout this whole presentation, it's money, 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 money that is pushing the recruitment, pushing the agenda of Islamic State, and if you're able to shut down those financial uh, networks, either through arrests or interdictions or blocking financial transfers and so forth, you at least try, you at least get to a point where you are able to stem and control um, the proliferation of, 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 of these violent extremist groups. Because if they do succeed in um, pulling off more spectacular terrorist attacks, such as they uh, did in Kampala in late 2021, then this is going to destabilize regional politics further because uh, events like that will will simply um, uh, um, provoke one government to 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 blame the other. And you I hear this all the time from officials. For example, in 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 the DRC, I've heard officials say, "Well, if we have a terrorist attack in Kinshasa, then it will be the Rwandans who've done this to us because we know that they've infiltrated the ADF." And I say, "Well, they they may have infiltrated the ADF to, to take care of their own national security, but it doesn't mean that they're going to purpose the ADF to perpetrate a terrorist attack on your soil." So it's that kind of rhetoric which then becomes very dangerous. And I think something has to take place in in terms of containment to actually stop. What has emerged already, we've gone past the point of prevention. It exists. There is preventative work that needs to be done, but there's also containment work that urgently needs to be put in place, and that has to start with financial investigations. Annalie, uh, last word. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, from my side, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of work that I've gone, gone into developing strategies on a national level. There's also a, a growing interaction between law enforcement agencies um, within mm -hmm. Eastern Africa through IAPCO, the same mm -hmm. with regards to SADC in Eastern and Southern Africa. There's growing links between and, and discussions and cooperation between 
um, between police agencies and intelligence agencies um, between Eastern and Southern Africa working together, dealing with these issues. So a lot of is happening beyond in terms of the overall. What I would like to see and something to, to maybe take forward is to think of growing civic education of where communities are being, being made responsible and understand their role um, and come forward with information. For example, it's interesting for me in, 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 in um, uh, preventing a, a, a terrorist attack in, in one of them was where the, where the, uh, where the um, a person didn't went didn't go to the police, but go but went to the local leader, in reporting suspicious activities. Um, so it's also for me a question of how do we enhance and building trust between between authorities and and local communities, where there's a, a growing sense of uh, responsibility towards not only their own safety and security but also the broader. I would also would like to see a growing wealth distribution. Um, we noticed, I think, that the Cabo Delgado issue really, the, the biggest spark is, yes, I agree with Dino, but I think also um, the question of natural resources, the question of to what extent local communities are actually benefiting from these, these wealth, um, I think is also driving this process moving forward. So if we want to see this situation being addressed, it's going to be requiring not only an immediate approach, but also a medium to long-term strategy uh, in addressing all of these different issues. That's not gonna be easy, uh, but it's, and we also shouldn't expect immediate uh, results. This is gonna be a, a media, really a long-term approach in addressing these issues that I don't think we, off, we tend to think about. We think about the immediate, not the long-term. Excellent. Um... <clears throat> Thank you, um, Anneli. Uh, and this would uh, conclude the, our, our our webinar. Again, the violence, uh, uh, violence extremism in, in Eastern Congo is bigger and more complex than the ADF. Uh, so to confront this threat that is expanding uh, is crucial for protecting the, you know, not Eastern uh, uh democratic republic the people there the people of the region so how do you thwart the uh this expansion uh further you have to formulate an intelligence uh, based strategy to first try to neutralize the adf uh, as dino and ali said to neutralize its cross-border uh, economic uh, networks uh, criminal networks logistical networks financial investigations are, are crucial here Again, as Dina said, money, money, that just pushes the recruitment. Uh, so you have to try to shut down these financial networks without obviously impacting the livelihood of, of people. So we have to be careful how we go about, about doing that. Uh, regional coordination is, is critical. So how do you de-escalate, uh, you know, this uh, regional political rift? Um, so uh, Anneli talked about uh, how international organizations, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, uh, you know, how uh, uh, Interpol, Afropol, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they have made uh, considerable uh, strides in trying to build the capacity, not only of the military, but law enforcement here, uh, agencies. Uh, and she gave the example of the Eastern Africa Police uh, Chief uh, Cooperation. Uh, so with, with that, uh, again, I would uh, like to, uh, to, thank, uh, to thank you all for your participation, our audience, uh, and uh, particularly to, uh, to our uh, excellent panelists I mean, for, their, uh, for their really uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, comments to, today. So please consider joining us uh, uh, for a subsequent uh, uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, stay safe, uh, well, and, um, and see you in future programs. Thank you very much.